Tales of a Wayside Inn by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow The Poet's Tale The Birds of Killingworth It was the season when through all the land the Merle and Mavis build, and building, sing those lovely lyrics written by his hand, whom Saxon Kaidmon calls the blithe heart king. When on the boughs the purple buds expand, the banners of the vanguard of the spring, and rivulets rejoicing rush and leap, and wave their fluttering signals from the steep. The robin and the bluebird, piping loud, filled all the blossoming orchards with their glee. The sparrows chirped, as if they still were proud their race in holy writ should mentioned be, and hungry crows assembled in a crowd clamoured their piteous prayer incessantly, knowing who hears the raven's cry and said, Give us, O Lord, this day our daily bread. Across the sound the birds of passage sailed, speaking some unknown language, strange and sweet, of tropic isle remote, and passing hailed the village with the cheers of all their fleet, or quarrelling together laughed and railed like foreign sailors landed in the street of seaport town, and without landish noise of oaths and gibberish, frightening girls and boys thus came the jocund spring in killingworth in fabulous days some hundred years ago and thrifty farmers as they tilled the earth heard with alarm the cawing of the crow that mingled with the universal mirth cassandra-like prognosticating woe they shook their heads and doomed with dreadful words to swift destruction the whole race of birds and a town meeting was convened straightway to set a price upon the guilty heads of these marauders, who, in lieu of pay, levied blackmail upon the garden beds and cornfields, and beheld without dismay the awful scarecrow with his fluttering shreds, the skeleton that waited at their feast, whereby their sinful pleasure was increased. Then from his house a temple painted white with fluted columns and a roof of red, the squire came forth, august and splendid sight, slowly descending with majestic tread three flights of steps, nor looking left nor right, down the long street he walked, as one who said, A town that boasts inhabitants like me can have no lack of good society. The parson, too, appeared, a man austere, the instinct of whose nature was to kill, the wrath of God he preached from year to year, and read with fervour Edwards on the will. His favourite pastime was to slay the deer in summer on some Adirondack hill. E'en now, while walking down the rural lane, he lopped the wayside lilies with his cane. From the academy, whose belfry crowned the hill of science with its vein of brass, came the preceptor, gazing idly round, now at the clouds and now at the green grass, and all absorbed in reveries profound of fair Almira in the upper class, who was, as in a sonnet he had said, as pure as water and as good as bread. And next the deacon issued from his door in his voluminous neckcloth, white as snow, a suit of sable bombazine he wore, his form was ponderous, and his step was slow. There never was so wise a man before. He seemed the incarnate, well, I told you so. And to perpetuate his great renown, there was a street named after him in town. These came together in the new town hall, with sundry farmers from the region round. The squire presided, dignified and tall his air impressive and his reasoning sound. Ill fared it with the birds, both great and small, hardly a friend in all that crowd they found, but enemies enough, who every one charged them with all the crimes beneath the sun. When they had ended, from his place apart rose the preceptor to redress the wrong, and, trembling like a steed before the start, looked round bewildered on the expectant throng. Then thought of fair Almira, 
and took heart to speak out what was in him clear and strong alike regardless of their smile or frown and quite determined not to be laughed down plato anticipating the reviewers from his republic banished without pity the poets in this little town of yours you put to death by means of a committee the ballad singers and the troubadours the street musicians of the heavenly city the birds who make sweet music for us all in our dark hours as david did for saul the thrush that carols at the dawn of day from the green steeples of the piney wood the oriole in the elm the noisy jay jargoning like a foreigner at his food the bluebird balanced on some topmost spray flooding with melody the neighbourhood linnet and meadow-lark and all the throng that dwell in nests and have the gift of song you slay them all and wherefore for the gain of a scant handful more or less of wheat or rye or barley or some other grain scratched up at random by industrious feet searching for worm or weevil after rain or a few cherries that are not so sweet as are the songs these uninvited guests sing at their feast with comfortable breasts do you ne'er think what wondrous beings these do you ne'er think who made them and who taught the dialect they speak where melodies alone are the interpreters of thought whose household words are songs in many keys sweeter than instrument of man e'er caught whose habitations in the tree-tops even are half-way houses on the road to heaven think every morning when the sun peeps through the dim leaf-latticed windows of the grove how jubilant the happy birds renew their old melodious madrigals of love and when you think of this remember too tis always morning somewhere and above the awakening continents from shore to shore somewhere the birds are singing evermore think of your woods and orchards without birds of empty nests that cling to boughs and beams as in an idiot's brain remembered words hang empty mid the cobwebs of his dreams will bleat of flocks or bellowing of herds make up for the lost music when your teams drag home the stingy harvest and no more the feathered gleamers follow to your door what would you rather see the incessant stir of insects in the windrows of the hay and hear the locust and the grasshopper their melancholy hurdy-gurdies play is this more pleasant to you than the whirr of meadow-lark and its sweet roundelay or twitter of little field-fares as you take your nooning in the shade of bush and brake you call them thieves and pillagers but know they are the winged wardens of your farms who from the cornfields drive the insidious foe and from your harvest keep a hundred harms even the blackest of them all the crow renders good service as your man-at-arms crushing the beetle in his coat of mail and crying havoc on the slug and snail how can i teach your children gentleness and mercy to the weak and reverence for life which in its weakness or excess is still a gleam of god's omnipotence or death which seeming darkness is no less the self-same light although averted hence when by your laws your actions and your speech you contradict the very things i teach with this he closed and through the audience went a murmur like the rustle of dead leaves the farmers laughed and nodded and some bent their yellow heads together like their sheaves men have no faith in fine-spun sentiment who put their trust in bullocks and in beeves the birds were doomed and as the record shows a bounty offered for the heads of crows there was another audience out of reach who had no voice nor vote in making laws but in the papers read his little speech and crowned his modest temples with applause they made him conscious each one more than each he still was victor vanquished in their cause sweetest of all the applause he won from thee o fair almira at the academy and so the dreadful massacre began 
o'er fields and orchards and o'er woodland crests the ceaseless fusillade of terror ran dead fell the birds with blood-stains on their breasts or wounded crept away from sight of man while the young died of famine in their nests a slaughter to be told in groans not words the very st bartholomew of birds the summer came and all the birds were dead the days were like hot coals the very ground was burned to ashes in the orchards fed myriads of caterpillars and around the cultivated fields and garden beds hosts of devouring insects crawled and found no foe to check their march till they had made the land a desert without leaf or shade devoured by worms like herod was the town because like herod it had ruthlessly slaughtered the innocents from the trees spun down the canker worms upon the passers-by upon each woman's bonnet shawl and gown who shook them off with just a little cry they were the terror of each favourite walk the endless theme of all the village talk the farmers grew impatient but a few confessed their error and would not complain for after all the best thing one can do when it is raining is to let it rain then they repealed the law although they knew it would not call the dead to life again as schoolboys finding their mistake too late draw a wet sponge across the accusing slate that year in killingworth the autumn came without the light of his majestic look the wonder of the falling tongues of flame the illumined pages of his doomsday book a few lost leaves blushed crimson with their shame and drowned themselves despairing in the brook while the wild wind went moaning everywhere lamenting the dead children of the air but the next spring a stranger sight was seen a sight that never yet by bard was sung as great a wonder as it would have been if some dumb animal had found a tongue a wagon overarched with evergreen upon whose boughs were wicker cages hung all full of singing birds came down the street filling the air with music wild and sweet from all the country round these birds were brought by order of the town with anxious quest and loosened from their wicker prisons sought in woods and fields the places they loved best singing loud canticles which many thought were satires to the authorities addressed while others listening in green lanes averred such lovely music never had been heard but blither still and louder carolled they upon the morrow for they seemed to know it was the fair almira's wedding day and everywhere around above below when the preceptor bore his bride away their songs burst forth in joyous overflow and a new heaven bent over a new earth amid the sunny farms of killingworth finale the hour was late the fire burned low the landlord's eyes were closed in sleep and near the story's end a deep sonorous sound at times was heard as when the distant bagpipes blow at this all laughed the landlord stirred as one awaking from a swound and gazing anxiously around protested that he had not slept but only shut his eyes and kept his ears attentive to each word then all arose and said good night alone remained the drowsy squire to rake the embers of the fire and quench the waning parlour light while from the windows here and there the scattered lamps a moment gleamed and the illumined hostel seemed the constellation of the bear downward athwart the misty air sinking and setting toward the sun far off the village clock struck one